Live from New York City, it's the Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll, broadcasting and video streaming live from our studios in New York City. I'd like to welcome you all. We're going to talk about how safe is the fish that you're consuming if you eat fish. I'll give you the latest report on that. Also, everyday chemicals that we're all exposed to are linked to chronic disease, especially in men, a new study from the University of uh, Adeline. And then anti-Alzheimer compounds found in plants, University of Tioma in Japan, and the University of Zurich, generous people live happier lives, and a lot more on health and healing. Then today I'll present the latest information on what's wrong with high Wi-Fi and cell phones and all those electromagnetic pulses that we're surrounded with. Also today, for those of you who still consume milk, I've got a little three-minute video clip for you. Now, not everyone can watch what we do unless you go to YouTube. When I say that we're video streaming, what it means is that we're recording the show in real time. But that doesn't mean you can watch it in real time. It means that we then post it on YouTube so more people, millions of people, can be exposed to it, where it would be limited to just those who are watching on Facebook, which is a substantially less. For example, we had almost 6 million people download uh, documentaries we did up on YouTube. So it's a, it's a way to reach a lot of people with important information. Also, I broadcast Monday to Friday, noon to 1, Eastern Standard Time, Tuesday from uh, 7 to 8 and p.m. And not always can you watch or listen. Sometimes you're working, you might get home at night. Well, you can download the program on the archives. In fact, you can load with one phone call up to five programs. Let me give that number so you never have to miss a program. That number is 701 719 9976. Again, 701 719 9976. But let's say that you're out and about anywhere in America or Canada and you want to listen over a phone or any portable listening device. Let me give that number to listen to live 712 775 6850. 712 775 6850 because some of the stations that you're used to hearing it on might preempt us because of special programming or fundraising, but we're on every day live, so you never have to miss a program if you go to those numbers. Now, I'm going to begin our program today by giving you the latest on fish. A lot of people say they're vegetarian. They've given up pork and beef and chicken, but they still eat fish. The only healthy fish to eat would be sardines. There are certain nucleic acids, which are very powerful in anti-aging uh, quality, and wild salmon. So if you choose to eat fish, those would be the two. You never want to eat a grouper. It's a bottom feeder. Catfish, it's a bottom feeder. And just remember, clams and filter all those toxins that are in the water in which they're grown right into their bodies. When you eat them, you're eating something that's very toxic. That's also true for all your crustaceans, meaning they have a crusty shell on the outside like lobsters and shrimp and oysters. So what happens when you go into a restaurant and you say, I want something healthy, I'll eat, a, I'll eat salmon. Normally it'll say North Atlantic salmon or Scottish salmon or Norwegian salmon, they're all farm-raised, which means that they're kept in very confined areas. They're very toxic. There's no room for them to swim at all. Thousands upon thousands are in an area half the size of a football field. And, of course, enormous amount of waste builds up. They're under stress. But there's something else to be concerned about. If you think because it's nice and pink, that's a coloring agent they add into the feed. But also from, this is from Mercy for Animals, Julia Capaleo. It says, fish farming is so filthy that salmon are getting lice. Yes. Quote, 
Last year, wholesale salmon prices rose by 50% due to an outbreak of sea lice from Sweden to Norway and Chile, That's according to The Guardian. A sea louse, or a common salmon louse, is a parasite that feeds on the blood, the skin, and the slime of salmon. Sea lice killed thousands of tons of farm fish just last year and caused skin lesions and secondary infections to millions more fish. Now, the parasite infests nearly half of Scotland's salmon farms. In fact, sea lice are more prevalent in farm salmon, and the confined spaces of factory farms are perfect breeding grounds for it. So what happens when you go to buy a piece of salmon? Well, if it's defective, you wouldn't buy it. In fact, there's three ways of knowing whether or not the fish you're buying is fresh or not. One, it's if you put your thumb on the skin and it stays indented. Two, that if you see that there's not a clear eye, but rather it's foggy. And three, the smell, which means it's decaying, it's, it's uh, decomposing. But what happens when you buy canned salmon? How do you know that it was inspected so that if there was lesions or cancer, that they would throw it away instead of canning it? After all, it's not something you can see. You're getting pieces of it. So my best advice at this time is there's no need for fish at all in your diet. All the amino acids that are ever required for total health you can get from a plant-based diet. It's out of print now, but it would be worth your while to try to find a copy of The Egg Project. You might uh, find it in the library. And if so, it's a study that I conducted at the Institute of Applied Biology many years ago that showed that all plants, from the beans and legumes and starchy vegetables, they all contain all eight essential amino acids in different combinations. And therefore, by having a meal... Uh, well, most macrobiotic restaurants is called a simple platter where they'll give you some sea vegetables like a seaweed and some rice or some grain like quinoa or rice. They'll give you some starchy vegetables and some greens like collard greens and kale and beans. Now, that's a perfect combination of blending together all those wonderful amino acids to you actually get more usable protein at a higher value than you would if you had meat or fish or chicken. In fact, it's even better than the egg. So there is no legitimate medical or nutritional or dietetic reason to have anything that has a heartbeat or face in your diet. Now, you may want it, and that's your choice, but you don't need it. So that's important to know. Also, generous people live happier lives. This is from the University of Zurich, and here's what it says. Generous people make people happier, even if they are a little, uh, if they're only a little generous. People who act solely out of self-interest are less happy, selfish people. Merely promising to be more generous is enough to trigger a change in our brains that makes us happier. This is what uh, neuroeconomics found in a recent study. And what some have been aware of for a long time, others find hard to believe. Those who are concerned about the well-being of their fellow human beings are happier than those who focus only on their own advancement. Doing something nice for another person gives many people a pleasant feeling that behavioral economists call a warm glow. In collaboration with international researchers from the Department of Economics, University of Zurich, they investigated this and found that it actually changes the brain and a person that gives something. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Over on the Upper West Side, there are a lot of churches, and some go to the extent of, in the morning, giving out whatever food that they can or have available that they've gotten from restaurants and stores to those who are homeless. And uh, I walk by there today on my way to work, and I work in mid-Manhattan now, no longer on the Upper West Side where I was for, I don't know, 25, 27 years, but a nice location, and there's plenty of people who need help, 
and I stop and talk with the people. What do you do? How long have you been unemployed? Where are you sleeping? What's it like? What adjustments do you have to make? How generous are people? And one of the people gave me an interesting story that he's an artist, has been, and after the relationship that he was in broke up, uh, that other person, the relationship, had really been supporting them. So he was able to do his artwork, but it was not commercially viable, but it was aesthetically pleasing, that ability to create. And then he found himself, for the first time, really thinking, wow, I didn't appreciate how much the other person was doing for me. They were going out to work every day, and I was benefiting from it. And so I asked him, did you ever take other people's generosity to you for granted? He says, absolutely, I did. But now I appreciate it because I realize what happens when people are not generous. And I said, what brings you to this neighborhood? And he said, well, I'm not from here, this neighborhood, but I find that the people on the Upper West Side tend to be very generous. When people walk down the street and no one, he, he says, look around you, no one's asking for anything here. They're just waiting patiently to see what food we might get. It might be a sandwich, it might be some soup, but we appreciate that. And every single person here, you'll hear him saying thank you to the people in the church. But if you're on the street, and he said, every day without fail, when people are walking up this street, he said, someone stops and gives a buck, gives five bucks, and uh, a smile. And, and I said, how do you think that makes a person feel when they have looked at a person who has a need, reached in their pocket, now, they can't feed everyone, but they're doing something. Makes them feel good. Makes them feel that they're connecting with another human being at a level that maybe in their normal work and family and, and business, they wouldn't. And it just made me think, and that's why I wanted to share this little story with you today, that we all have gifts. We're not all equal. I'll never be able to play basketball like LeBron James or Jim Curry but maybe they won't be able to give a, a, a five-hour lecture spontaneously and improvisational as I would. And someone else has the gift of music. Everyone has a gift. No one is born without the capacity to have a gift. It's mastering that gift, finding that gift, opening yourself up and deconditioning yourself to what you were told should be your gift and going to that level through solitude, through introspection and saying, what, what is my gift? What, why was I put on this planet? And those people who find that place and then continue that journey, they're always happiest, no matter what other circumstances are occurring in their life. But if we have a gift, I believe we have a moral and spiritual responsibility to share it, to give it away. Whether someone says thanks or not is not the issue. It is knowing that you have made your life Align, harmonize with your spiritual self by being generous where you didn't have to be. And giving through charities is not the same. I believe that you should go out and look someone in the eyes, listen to their story, and then let them know you care about them. Maybe they need toiletries, so take them to a drugstore and, and get them to everybody needs something on the street. And we got a lot of people on the street. And by the way, We've got 10 times more people on the street than what official statistics are. So, and you're going to feel better about life also. You just feel good when you're doing good. So something to think about. Now, for those of you who know someone with Alzheimer's, here is new research, and I always like to get to the cutting-edge stuff. This is from University of Toyana in Japan, Quote, researchers have identified active compounds in Drynaria, that's D-R-Y-N-A-R-I-A, rhizome, R-H-I-Z-O-M-E, which improves memory and reduces Alzheimer characteristics. Now, this is a medicinal plant, and it's long been valued for its role in treating numerous diseases, but they found the actual molecules within the plant, and they published an article in Frontiers in Pharmacology, talking about this. So, once again, in nature, we found what is called a functional food, meaning a, 
there is a function in the body to it. For example, if I ask you to take blueberries, it's a functional food. Blueberries are loaded with very important polyphenols that can protect your brain, turn off inflammation in your brain, help slow down all brain diseases, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, and it's in the scientific literature. Whereas if you took vitamin C, the single most important nutrient in all of nature, there's at least 50 different things that it can do. It depends upon the amount and how you take it. Generally, it's best to take it in a protein shake because then you won't be getting hyperacidic reaction from your stomach. You see, your stomach has a low pH, around 2.2, and that's, that's a lot of hydrochloric acid. So when you take in ascorbic acid, Ascorbic acid hits hydrochloric acid, and frequently you get a uh, reaction, bloating, gas, distension. Sometimes if you take too much, you'll get diarrhea. But if you take that same amount of vitamin C in a buffered form, chelated form, and you put it into a smoothie, just a banana smoothie, then it's easier to get through your digestion. You get more of it. You can take it more often during the day. And a lot of people, especially older people, don't like to take vitamins. So this is one way that you get them to take them. You say, what's your favorite taste? Well, I like chocolate. Okay. So you put some raw cacao chocolate into a blender. You throw in maybe some rice milk, coconut milk, non-dairy. And then you put in your vitamin C. Maybe you put in alpha lipoic acid, even some garlic or onion capsules. So whatever you want them to have, it's all and blended up. And the predominant taste is not the sulfur from alpha lipoic acid or the sulfuro group, which they w- would not like, but they would like it because you have a dominant flavor enhancer <clears throat> and disguiser. And by the way, chocolate is the major disguiser of bad taste. So anytime I want to give someone something that's good for them, though they don't like the taste, I, I disguise it in chocolate. So it's just something to pass on. And also, everyday chemicals linked to chronic disease in men. This is from the University of Adelaide. Quote, chemicals found in everyday plastics are linked to cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure in men. Researchers from the South Australian Health and uh, Medical Research Institute and University of Adelaide investigated the independent association between chronic disease, the one I just mentioned, among men, and taking these concentrates. This was published in Environmental Research. Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about food packaging. You know, let's say you buy something that's wrapped up, right? The wrapper that, let's say, if you're eating something that was hot, the wrapper is going to leach because the heat is going to leach chemicals into the food, that you're consuming. That's not good. If you, when I was growing up, um, our mothers would make baked potatoes by greasing up a potato with um, butter and then putting it in aluminum foil and stick it in the oven. They didn't know that aluminum foil, when you add heat to it, it, it leaches. That, and, or even something with acidic background, like a tomato. If you were making a tomato sauce and you, you put it into a plastic container, the tomato's acidity causes the plastic container chemicals to leach into that. And when you drink a, from a soft bottle, let's say um, in even water, and that's what we were giving all of our GIs over in, in Iraq and Kuwait back in 1991 until this day. They're sitting out in the sun. And by the way, one of the hottest places on earth yesterday was 126 degrees. You can't stay out in that weather for more than about 10 minutes before you could risk a heat stroke. And nothing can grow in that. And that's why seeds are dying all over the place. Even in Montana today, which is one of the hardiest soils for growing hard wheat, uh, what's called northern wheat, versus Texas that can grow a different type of wheat, different type of rice, it's so hot that it's burned half the wheat crop out. Now, this wasn't in the newspaper. I, every day in the morning at 4 o'clock when I get up, I look at a special website that tells me all about the weather events, how many hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, temperature, the coldest temperature in Antarctica yesterday, minus 110 degrees, 
the hottest temperature, rain on the Antarctic shelf, which is very dangerous. The breaking off, as I told you, in fact, this was the radio station, the radio program that told you before anyone else in the media that the Larson B shelf was going to break, and the mainstream media said it would be 100 years. It broke two weeks later. And I told you that the Larson C shelf, was, which is a backstop to the glaciers, which at a very high angle, a high angle going into the water, that meant now it broke, it's gone. That means that all that trillions of tons of ice and snow that were being held back Here's the glacier, let's, say at, let's just say a 30-degree angle, and here's that. That buffering ice shelf now is gone. That's going to start calving into the water. <clears throat> so now we're going to see, e- even though the Larsen Sea Shelf was at the southeast, uh, southwest corner of Antarctica, on a rather relatively thin peninsula, still a huge amount of ice that's going to go in the water. And once that starts, it can start a whole cascading of other ice sheets. So we're going to get water coming, and it's not going to be predictable. It'll be in large quantities, and it'll be in a relatively short period of time. So anyhow, I like to know what's going on in the world. The mainstream media is not going to cover it. When I told my friends in California, it's time to look for another sustainable and nice environment. You've enjoyed California for all that it offers, good. But you're gonna have an earthquake out there. It's past due. There's already rumblings. You're gonna have more forest fires, and worse forest fires than you've ever had in the state's history. That's happening now, as it is in 17 states. But you wouldn't know it, because now it's just normal to have the worst fires in Arizona history in the last three days, and they're growing. And it's getting too dry. And so more things are drying out. So if something can't grow, and then you got the little Colorado that supplies over 40 million people in the Southwest, including Los Angeles, with their water. And if the Colorado, because of global warming and because of all the municipalities using the water along the way, and because of trade deals with Arizona and other countries, to other counties and, and states to use their water, In the next five years, you're going to have severe drought in Los Angeles and everything below that because you don't have your own natural aquifers. It has to come through the Great Canal, the Sierra Madres, and where it might have a lot of snow one year, it might go five years with no snowpack. You're simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. So my suggestion is start looking for other places. But in any case, going back to uh, Kuwait and, and Iraq and Afghanistan where we have soldiers, they're getting all this water, that water sitting out in the heat in plastic bottles. That, those plastic bottles are leaching the chemicals from the plastic into the water. That means that they're hydrating, and about 72% of your total body is water. They're getting all these chemicals, and that's playing havoc with their kidneys, their liver, their brain, and their heart. So if you're going to drink it, drink it out of glass and... 99.6% of 1,500 Australian men selected at random tested positive near urine samples for these chemicals. So it's almost 100% because of how many chemicals we use in our, our life. I also wanted now to give you a little information <clears throat> on these new 5G cell towers and smart meters that are increasing the microwave radiation and invading privacy. This research, which is really good, and I commend John P. Thomas of Health Impact News for creating this, here's what he says, quote, when the Federal Communication Commission approved the use of 5G microwave communication technology in 2016 and approved the use of microwave frequencies in the 30 gigahertz range, they opened the door to even higher levels of human illness and severe disability for American children and adults. Microwave radiation, such as that currently being used in cell phones, Wi-Fi routers, and smart meters, has already been linked to numerous health effects. The introduction of even more intense levels of microwave exposure at higher frequencies will push many people into life-threatening chronic illness. High-frequency microwave radiation is often overlooked as a causative factor in illness because most conventional health care providers 
government regulators and telecom companies and electric utilities believe microwave radiation used in communication technology is harmless. It is not. Despite the warnings being raised by scientists, well-informed health care providers and grassroots organizations about existing and future microwave hazards, telecom companies are planning to implant 5G technology throughout every urban area in America. They're already testing this new generation wireless, which is very toxic, in Boston, Austin, Palo Alto, and Mountain View, California. And so, in fact, in California, get this, so for the people living in California, quote, proposed legislation in California would permit telecom companies to erect 50,000 50,000 new microwave antennas in residential and commercial areas without municipal approval. The G5 microwave antennas would be placed on top of existing utility poles or on public infrastructure such as schools, libraries, or bus uh, shelters, and public parks. And then it goes into the dangers, the ringing in the ears, dizziness, disturbed sleep at night, sleepless, uh, sleepiness during the daytime, moodiness, irritability, unsociability, feelings of fear, anxiety, nervous tension, mental depression, memory impairment, pain in muscles, pain in the region of the heart, breathing difficulties, that's just to name some. Inflammation caused by excessive histamine in the blood, oxidative stress, autoimmune uh, responses, reduced blood flow to the region of the uh, thalamus, a p- uh, pathologic leakage to the blood-brain barrier, and a deficit in melatonin metabolic ac- availability have been observed. In fact, there is evidence that existing and new frequencies of microwave radiation are associated with cancer, heart disease, neurological dysfunction, immune system suppression, cataracts in the eyes, and sperm malformation. This is a six-page report, and also AT&T is making it its way to get, well, 50% of homes are wireless, but they want to get 100%. They also want to get it to where they'll allow more of it, and even if you don't want it on your home, if they get their way, you won't have any choice. If you want AT&T, if you want a telephone or phone service, you'll have to allow them to put these microwave antennas on your home. Just a heads up of how tough it is. Now, I was going to give um, my report on what to do so that we can actually implement universal health care. So no American, because of existing conditions or finances, will have to pay a penny towards any medical procedure. Uh, I'm not talking about cosmetic surgery, ones that you actually need and require. <clears throat> and I've broken it down into a complete report. It's fully vetted. It's accurate. But I will not have time today, but I will do it at the beginning of tomorrow's program. And I'll show you how without, without it, it being an impact upon our federal deficit that we can save over almost $2 trillion $2 trillion a year over our current medical uh, industrial complex budget, have better health care, better quality of medical input, more time spent with our primary care physician, preventative health care facilities. Now, none of what I'm going to say has been discussed in any of the Democratic or Republican, excuse me, Republican forums. Everything that you're hearing is based upon what the pharmaceutical industry, the insurance industry, the private and profitable um, uh, hospital associations and their lobbyists have been able to write and implement as law. Well, this they have nothing to do with. So, universal health care, how can we do it? What would it include? That'll be tomorrow. We're going to go to our guest in about eight minutes from now. We're going to take a break, however, right now and come right back. So, please stay with us. Nice to have you with us, everyone. We're going to talk in a few moments about chronic fatigue syndrome. My guest will be Hillary Johnson, who is one of the most knowledgeable people in the United States 
about chronic fatigue, how it's been misdiagnosed, what's the real cause or causes, and what are the most appropriate treatments. And so this is new and vital information you'll be hearing. But before then, we're just going to take a few moments to help our sister station, WBAI, where I've been going now 41 years, um, longest-running daily non-commercial radio program in the United States. They're going through a rough time. Today, they are outside of the Empire State Building, or excuse me, the City Hall, and then the Empire State Building. Somewhere they're having a press conference, and uh, they've been promoting it heavily, and I hope they have a good turnout. They are trying to get the Empire State Building, where our antenna is, to renegotiate with them. They owe about $2.2 million now, a total of $4 million by the time they finish up their lease, and they simply don't have that money. Actually, they do have that money. They have far enough money. They have about $10 million in real estate. And that simply, as I asked the executive director of uh, Pacifica, why don't you just get a mortgage and pay off all the debt? And they said, well, can't because it's not the Empire State Building, but Demock Chanel and Amy Goodman are owed somewhere in the neighborhood of $3 million. And and not willing to forgive the debt, and as long as we have that debt, we won't get any loan. So my suggestion is a good group of people who are friendly with uh, Amy Goodman go to her and suggest that for the, for the survival of Pacifica and her so-called beloved BAI, why doesn't she simply forgive that debt, which she's capable of doing. She's very wealthy and has made about $72 million since she privatized Democracy Now! That would be a good gesture kind of rebalance some of that karma. And that would take away the largest debt that we have. <clears throat> and then, hopefully, because of politicians suggesting that give us a break, it would be a very easy break for the Empire State Building to do, to forgive the $2 million or make some adjustment for its payment. And then BAI could go over to another very inexpensive, market-valued, um, which is about 12,000-year transmitter, which does exist, but we can't get out of one lease. So that said, that I hope that they do well. But in the interim, everyone's forgetting something very basic. All the people who supported the station, and we're grateful for that, they need to get their premiums because at the end of the day, you lose audience if you don't, which is one of the major reasons. Set aside the, the politics. Set aside the uh, the alienation, all the other possible reasons that we've lost management, um, being out of touch. If you just keep asking people to give you money and you don't give them something in return that they're promised, they're not going to stay around forever, even the hardcore ones. So we've been doing all we can to get the premiums to people I personally paid for out of my own pocket, my own efforts, thousands. But we got to get another system that actually works better. I have a system, and the system is simple. As people make a donation, you have two bank accounts. Immediately, the amount of a premium goes into one bank account. The rest goes into a general fund to pay all the other necessary expenses. And that way, that money immediately goes into buying the premiums for any one show on the air and pick, pack, and shipping it out. That way, we have a quick system of getting the a person's donation, processing it, and then if it's a credit card, and then sending their premium, as any other system does in a reasonable period of time. Hopefully, they will take that advice. But in the interim, what I'm doing, I was asked by Tony Bates to raise some funds to help with this last fund drive to get these premiums out, because not one single premium, at least from my program, I can't speak for any others, has been sent out yet, yet the next drive is starting, I believe, next week. And I can't, in good ethics, I cannot ask people for money if those premiums haven't been paid for and gotten out. So hopefully we will raise some money, enough to buy some premiums, and then send them out. That's our goal. To do that, we had a couple options. I could do a lecture. Last time I had raised about $30,000. I could do a premiere. That raised about $35,000. But that takes too much time. That they would have planned it much in advance. Couldn't do that till August or September, which they are planning. And I'm happy to donate my time and films to do that. 
But the one thing we can do is we can ask people who want to change their life for the better, who want to de-stress, detox, who want to look at their body differently and say, how did I get high blood pressure, cholesterol elevated, overweight, diabetes, prediabetes? How do you get all this pain? And what can I do to live a healthier life by making better choices? That's what you learn in a retreat. Because in a retreat for one week or two weeks, you're in a very beautiful but a healthy environment where every one of the staff is selected because of their capacity to share positive energy. The food, the juices, you could drink 15 glasses of juice a day, major cleansing, de-stressing, spending quality time with introspection in nature, wonderful, beautiful gardens that you can sit in, rose gardens with 30 different types of roses in one garden, with wonderful aromatic plants, jasmine and lilac and lavender. You can commune with nature. You can do water aerobics in a saltwater pool. You can take mineral baths. You can get so many wonderful lessons, art classes. And I've seen what people who didn't think they had any artistic skill at the end had gorgeous, creative uh, pieces of art that they had drawn or painted because we have outstanding professional artists there on staff who help. Cooking classes, raw food gourmet presentation. Our chef is a gourmet chef. Um, And he is a vegan, so everything is vegan. And so it's just a wonderful environment. Nothing else like it. In fact, on the line right now, because I want to go to our guest in the next minute or two, we have Luann Panessi. And Luann has someone who had been at a retreat. And Luann, could you introduce who's on the line with you, please? Absolutely. I I brought on a registered nurse. Her name is Barbara Duggan. She's attended uh, more than one retreat, and uh, and I think that she could give your audience a, a wonderful perspective about the magic that happens. People have often said, I stepped out of the van and onto the property, and it was just a magical experience. So, Barbara, if you wanted to share with us some of your your views. Of course, of course. Um, I Luann, hi, Gary. Uh, as anyone who has ever gone on a vacation or looked for a home or an apartment, you know that a neighborhood has energy. And Gary has picked out in his place an amazingly peaceful, beautiful area. And then he has amplified it by what he has put in it. Um, There have been so many times that I've been able to just go off peacefully and to meditate. And within that, there's a healing uh, and an energy that it's hard to describe. It opens you up to understanding yourself um, to a healing power within you that you may not have even realized was there. Uh, There's also animals there, and animals in and of themselves have an amazing energy to give and a love to give. There are swans. There are lakes. Um, It's something that... In my own life, I have never experienced before, and I'm so glad that I have the opportunity to go back. I only have about 60 seconds, Barbara, but I'm going to ask you for some short answers. How long have you been a nurse? I've been a nurse for over 40 years. 40 years. Okay. Coming to these retreats, have you seen things that could not be explained within the medical (laughs) paradigm that you've been a part of for 40 years? Absolutely. Absolutely. Have you seen Absolutely. have you seen orthodox physicians there who've seen things happen that they have never seen and stated they've never seen in their medical practice but were real because they were there and they actually examined people who came with something and left with nothing? Yes. What was the most remarkable situation that you observed that no one had an answer for? <clears throat> uh, the most remarkable one was a woman with uh, end-stage COPD, which is emphysema who came in with oxygen, and she gradually, through the healing of the place, through the healing of the food, and through the uh, assistance of the staff, she was ending up by the second and third day, she was doing walks, walks initially down the driveway, and then she was out walking on the road, and she was not using her oxygen. And her comment was, at the end of the week, I'm going home, my husband is not going to know who I am. 
She in, so significantly improved. In, in her last day there, when I asked people, would you like to share your experience? Now, she came. She was on oxygen. She was bent over. Uh, she was diabetic. Uh, she had a high blood pressure. She was sitting in a wheelchair, and she couldn't do more than move her feet. Uh, on the last day, did she start to laugh and laugh for five straight minutes? And I mean, oh, huge laughs. Yeah. And didn't try if you have if you have end stage emphysema, end stage emphysema, because she had been a fifty year smoker. Try laughing. You can't even talk. And she laughed for five straight minutes. Do you remember that? I do. She was standing. She was laughing. She was talking, and she was without oxygen. Her color was good. Her energy was good. It, it was uh, a miracle. On the last day, did she walk three miles unaided? Uh, she did. Mm -hmm. She did, and she was very proud of that fact. Very she, proud and amazed. She should have been, because in every person there is the desire to be optimally healthy. We just have to liberate that in the right people, the right place, the right food, the right energy. You can liberate and have a wonderful experience. Barbara, you've seen a lot. You've seen a lot of people change if they choose to. You've seen the power of positive energy. You've seen the power of positive energy exchange. So I want to thank you. Are you coming in October? Yes, I am for two weeks, Gary. Good. We'll look forward to seeing yes. you. Thank you, Barbara. So if you'd like to join me, I'll be there every day and helping people in their journey of health and healing in one of the most remarkable, tranquil, peaceful places where we ask people to stay uh, silent and introspective and journal about their lives. You're guided in this uh, journey. Tasty food, delicious gourmet food. Give Luann a call. Her number is 903-881-7008. Again, 903-881-7008. 7008, and this is a special fundraiser for WBAI, our sister station, New York. That money will be used to help purchase premiums and get them right out the door for you. Thank you, Luann, and thank you, Barbara. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll. This segment of our program is devoted to social issues. Our social issue today is who created ISIS? Where did it originate? And what are the contradictions when it comes to fighting the war on terror? Last evening, I watched Tucker Carlson having a debate with a legislator. The night before, he had a different debate and where a, a Colonel Ralph Peters, for all intents and purposes, called him a Nazi collaborator or equated him to being one. And that's simply because I believe that Carl, uh, Carlson Tucker was trying to explain that Trump working with Russia for a common goal of ending terrorism in Syria was a good idea. And he's right. But here's the untold story that I want to share with this audience. And everything I'm telling you is backed up by substantial documentation, detailed scholarly articles that are published on PRN.FM's website, Progressive Radio Network's website, will attest to this. First and foremost, in more than 14 months, when the ISIS, al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, and other terrorist groups were taking over uh, Syria, and were actually engaged in part of Iraq, the United States did nothing to stop the flow of oil going from, let's say, ISIS stealing the oil, and there were over 12,000 tanker trucks going from Turkey into Syria, loading up this very good oil, taking it back into Turkey, and then it was reported, alleged that Erdogan, the president of uh, Turkey's son, was selling this on the black market for as low as $20 a barrel or under half the prevailing price. Needless to say, there was a huge market who wouldn't want to buy a barrel of oil, high-quality crude, for $20 a barrel when others were paying $40 to $70 a barrel. And that was being used to fund ISIS 
as well as people putting it in their own pocket. It was estimated that ICE was earning between $1 to $4 million a day. Now visualize this. Visualize 12,000 trucks. I mean, you don't, you don't have to have much of imagination to realize that that is miles and miles of a convoy. And with the quality of our satellites and the National Security Agency and the CIA's intelligence assets, it's clear that everyone in the intelligence field, the CIA, the, um, the, the Homeland Security, everybody knew that ISIS was being funded with this oil, and we chose not to stop it. In the process, we were looking at regime change. We wanted to sought out of there not because he represented a clear and present threat to the United States. He did not. In my interviews with real journalists, not those we find over at CNN or New York Times, but real journalists who were in there during the conflict said that this was not a civil war. This was a regime change. This was a coup. And therefore, we are allowing ISIS to do our work for us. I'm assuming after it was finished and Assad was killed, then in comes the... um, Mediators, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United States, France, and Great Britain, and divide the spoils. Well, look how that went in other countries like Libya or Afghanistan. Now, who benefits when all these bombs are dropped and the private mercenary armies go in and the weapons are given into their hands? Well, the military industrial contractors benefit. But it was Russia who came in and blew up all those trucks. It was Russia that went in and started targeting all terrorist groups in Syria, not just ISIS. And without Russia's intervention, whatever their ulterior motive, they stopped Assad and the Syrian people from becoming a failed state and overrun just like Libya's uh, and Gaddafi. That would happen to Syria. And yet the Mainstream media and the liberal media are refusing to accept these simple facts. But now let's go over to Truth and Media and Ben Swan for a more detailed, comprehensive insight into the creation of ISIS and look at America's fingerprints all over it. So we're trying to fight a war on terror that we created, we're funding, we're training, we're protecting, including our allies that are a part of this up to their eyeballs, and spreading a massively hateful form of Islam, Wahhabism, out of the Sunni sect. So that part of the story the media's not telling you. Now Ben Swan. وَلَقَدْ سَبَقَتْ كَلِمَتُنَا لِعِبَادِنَا الْمُرْسَلِينَ It is the most important story in the country. The next major war for the United States is with ISIS. But what media and politicians are not telling you the truth about where ISIS came from, who created them, and why before one more dollar is spent, one more American life lost, you need to know the truth. The first step toward truth is to be informed. The name ISIS is one that every American knows by now. The biggest threat to our national security since Al-Qaeda, right? They are a brutal, savage group known for public beheadings and mass executions. They are the face of the new war on terror. Right now, the U.S. military is conducting airstrikes in Syria in a supposed attempt to take out ISIS targets. Meanwhile, the White House and military leaders are talking about possible boots on the ground in Iraq again only three years after the war in Iraq was declared over. In fact, this war, according to former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, could last for decades. We're looking at uh, kind of a 30-year war uh, kind of uh, history here. So who exactly is ISIS and where did they come from? It's entirely a creation of the United States' behavior in Iraq. That's how we got to where we are because of war, because of occupation, because of torture. For answers, we traveled to Los Angeles to meet with Angela Keaton, the founder of antiwar.com. We destabilized and wrecked Iraq. I mean, it it caused it to to fail miserably, and that's entirely the responsibility of the United States government. There's no one else at fault there. I mean, as horrible as Saddam Hussein was, there was 
you know, Iraq was not unstable. It was a functioning country as much as those sorts of things go and it was not a particularly horrible hellhole if you were a religious minority. To understand where ISIS comes from, you have to understand two storylines. The first is what Keaton just said. When the U.S. first went into Iraq, we blew the country apart. We destroyed the government, toppled Saddam Hussein, destroyed infrastructure, and most importantly, left behind a power vacuum. One that would have never have existed had Hussein not been overthrown by the U.S. government. Daniel McAdams with the Ron Paul Institute says this is an historical fact that media just won't discuss. All of this has to do with U.S. action in the region, which destroyed the infrastructure, which destroyed Iraqi society, which destroyed the government. Uh, you had a lot of people who lived under Saddam Hussein, uh, who may not have been as, as happy as Lark's. Nevertheless, they were living somewhat normal lives. The U.S. put a government in power in Baghdad uh, that all of a sudden was, was their enemies, that treated them very, very badly. Now that is the easy part of the story. The U.S. created conditions in Iraq where ISIS could get its start. But here's the other storyline that you have to understand, that even with Saddam gone, ISIS still couldn't have risen to power had it not been for what happened next. ISIS actually began as a small insurgent group in Iraq in 2006. They had no money, no real ability to recruit, but they did work to create very limited problems for the U.S. military. It wasn't until 2009 that ISIS shifted its focus from Iraq, where it was largely unsuccessful in developing a foothold, and focused on the civil war in Syria. Even there, ISIS struggled to gain any foothold because the two largest groups fighting against President Bashar al-Assad were al-Nusra Front, or al-Qaeda, and the Free Syrian Army. Then came a pivotal moment that most Americans aren't even aware of. In June of 2013, a northern general for the Free Syrian Army spoke out on Al Jazeera Qatar and stated that if international forces did not send weapons the rebels attempting to overthrow Syrian President Bashar al-Assad would lose their war in just one month. Well, only months before, I had personally confronted President Obama about why the U.S. was covertly funding those Syrian rebels. And yet there's some concern about the U.S. funding uh, the Syrian opposition when yeah. there are a lot of reports that al-Qaeda is yeah. kind of heading up that opposition. Yeah. How do you justify the two? Well, I, uh, I share that concern. Uh, and so uh, what we've done is to say, we will provide non-lethal assistance to Syrian opposition leadership that are committed to a political transition, committed to uh, a, uh, an observance of human rights. We're not going to just dive in and get involved with a civil war that in fact uh, involves some elements of people who are genuinely trying to get a better life, but also involve uh, some folks who would over the long term do of the United States harm. So even as the president acted as if he was being careful, politicians like Senator John McCain demanded action. So it's a totally unfair and unbalanced fight. And now the rebels are the freedom fighters. The, uh, the Syrian National Army are, uh, are being beaten every place around Syria because of the overwhelming firepower and air power is really the deciding factor. So you've got to take their air power, power out of it. You've got to have a safe zone where they can operate, train and equip. And uh, we've got to turn this thing around. So what happened? Well, within just a matter of weeks of that Syrian general making his plea for international help, the US, the Saudis, Jordan, Qatar, Turkey and Israel began providing weapons and training and money to the so-called rebel Free Syrian Army. By September of 2013, American media outlets, including CNN and the Washington Post, were reporting that CIA-funded weapons had begun flowing to Syrian rebels. The weapons were not American-made, but funded and organized by the CIA. The artillery was described as light weapons, some anti-tank weapons and ammunition. But where it all fell apart, Weapons that the U.S. insisted would be used by freedom fighters would be in less than one year in the hands of ISIS fighters. So where were these fighters coming from? Actually, from the Free Syrian Army, the group that John McCain insisted would help the U.S. to overthrow Assad. That same group actually giving weapons, selling weapons, and sending fighters to join with this new group called the Islamic State. It was in June of 2014 when suddenly, after being a no-name group in Syria, 
that ISIS emerged, heavily armed and trained by U.S. and coalition special forces, making a dramatic entrance by crossing back over the Syrian border into Iraq, capturing Mosul and much of the northern part of the country. One of the most important facts that mainstream media ignores time and time again is that ISIS was able to grow so fast because of all the U.S. military equipment they were able to seize, equipment that our military left in Iraq, truckloads of Humvees, tanks, and weaponry that instead of taking or destroying, the U.S. government simply decided to leave behind. Even when the U.S. government knew that ISIS fighters were capturing that equipment, for crying out loud, these guys were posting pictures of themselves driving and standing on U.S. military equipment, making video of themselves with it. We did nothing. Why? How is it the U.S. had no idea that this threat was coming? Uh, how many billions do we spend? Maybe a hundred billion on the on the total intelligence community budget over over the year. How is it that they had no idea? How is it that if this was such a threat? As, uh, as um, John McCain and Lindsey Graham are fond of reminding us, how is it that it was missed so unbelievably, so egregiously? Over the past few months, the U.S. government, who acted like they had never even heard of ISIS, suddenly, with the help of media, has turned the Islamic State into the new focus of the war on terror. Now, as ISIS has continued its rise, recruitment is exploding, and the group is becoming stunningly wealthy. ISIS is the, is the best funded terrorist group in the world. They make some, I think it's $2 million a day selling oil, much of it to Turkey, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, and if you look at the U.S. response to this, uh, the U.S. response to ISIS becoming extremely rich by selling oil and undercutting the competition is to blow up the oil fields, which to me makes no sense. You're blowing up the infrastructure. It happens to be in Syria, so you might think that there is a, a, another motive there. But why wouldn't you, the U.S. sanctions anything that moves when it's angry? Why can't you sanction the banks that are helping finance these deals? Why can't you sanction the oil companies that are participating in this? Why do you blow up the oil fields? It's a great question. And here are some other questions that defy logic when you start looking for answers. Why is the U.S. sending $500 million to the Free Syrian Army to fight ISIS when the FSA is one of the biggest suppliers of fighters and weapons to ISIS? Why are we sending new and more powerful weapons to the FSA like anti-aircraft missiles, weapons that we know will end up in the hands of ISIS? ISIS, of course, is going to now have anti-aircraft missiles provided by the U.S. and the Saudis. The Saudis got, are getting them from the Chinese, though, now, so there can be plausible deniability because inevitably these sweethearts in the sweetheart rebel groups in Syria are going to start shooting down, if they have the ability, passenger, passenger jets. And then we're going to want the plausible deniability say, no, 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 it's the Chinese weaponry, as if it's going to make any difference. Well, there are so many questions that we could ask, but let's just cut to the chase here, because what you need to know about this is that ISIS is not the creation of American inaction, which is what the media is going to tell you. No, they are the product of direct action. First, the action of creating a power vacuum in Iraq, and secondly, arming violent jihadists, hoping they would overthrow a leader in a neighboring Middle Eastern country. McAdams says the U.S. government is a victim of its own insane policies. Well, I think the U.S. is really a hostage to its own regime change philosophy. Uh, you know, the U.S. is very good at blowing things up and destroying societies, but it is very, very bad at putting them back together. Is that true? Well, you decide. Fact. Our government armed Osama bin Laden and the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and created al-Qaeda. Fact. Our government we helped supply Saddam Hussein chemical weapons for him to use against Iran in 1980 and then overthrew him in 2003. Fact. Our government trained rebel fighters in Syria who would become the group today known as ISIS or the Islamic State. We have watched them commit every violent atrocity that you can imagine to people living in Iraq and Syria. And now we want American taxpayers to fund a 30-year war against them. No, it's not the U.S. government being held hostage by these crazy policies. It's the American people. And it's time that we reject the destruction of people groups around the world for the sake of foreign policy that makes so-called defense contractors rich and perpetuates violence, death, 
and destruction of entire people groups because humanity is greater than politics. Hope that clarifies some point that the mainstream and alternative media are not willing to share with you. But that's what we do here. We tell the truth. I'm Gary Knoll. Thank you all for listening. Look forward to sharing more tomorrow. Have a nice day. Thank you.